Hello, everyone. Welcome to UOA On Demand. My name is Dr. Kevin Schaefer, and I am an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon here at UOA. I'm joined today by Dr. Justin Fleming, one of my foot and ankle colleagues at UOA. And today we are going to be talking about ankle fusions. Um, I know there's another recording on ankle replacements, and there'll certainly will be some overlap, but be sure to check that one out too if you haven't seen it. Um, so, Justin, welcome. Good to see you again. Hey, good to see you as well, as well, Kevin. So let's just start out with one of the basic questions that many patients ask. What is an ankle fusion and why might you need one? Sure. So ankle fusion is essentially where we take the, uh, the shin bone and the ankle bone and we fuse them or, or mate them together. And the, the purpose of that is to alleviate pain. So people need an ankle fusion uh, if they develop arthritis in the ankle. And so one of the ways to reduce pain, eliminate pain is to remove the source of pain, which is the joint and the fusion removes the ankle joint. And that's where we come up with uh, an ankle fusion. Right, and just so the audience knows, what are some common reasons that you might need an ankle fusion? Yeah, the, the most common uh, is arthritis, typically that occurs after an injury. Um, there are certain subsets of patients that have severe deformity, whether it's congenital or post-traumatic. Um, there are patients who have had uh, neuromuscular injury, perhaps the muscles or the, uh, the nerves uh, that control the foot and ankle don't work. And so those are, would all be reasonable options for ankle fusions. Right. Okay. So let's say you're a patient, you see us in clinic. Let's talk about the different treatment options. Obviously, you know, we always try the non-surgical stuff before we go forward with the fusion. If, if you're someone with ankle arthritis, what are the options uh, before a fusion and do they work? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and what I find, and I'm sure you see the same, but the majority of patients that you see that have ankle arthritis have been dealing with this for so long that they've right. tried a lot of these things. So um, the basics are activity modifications, essentially doing things that don't hurt or picking activities that provide the least amount of pain. Um, number two, anti-inflammatories, um, ice, elevation, compression sleeves. Um, one thing that I that we've had some success with is um, different types of sneakers. They're called rocker bottom sneakers. Um, there's a popular brand called Hoka um, that seems to reduce or eliminate some of the stress on the ankle joint. Um, and then certainly there are injections and braces and sometimes physical therapy as well. Right. And I actually had a patient uh, call me today who had end-stage arthritis and asked me about PRP. I know that gets a lot of airplay and people are excited about it. What do you think about PRP or BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, those sorts of things? Can they help patients with arthritis? Sure, I think they can. And I think honestly, from a, from a physician level, I struggle a little bit because we just don't have a lot of research, right? But there's not a, an overwhelming amount of literature. And unfortunately, these things are not covered by insurances. So there's a financial burden to the patient. Um, but certainly in, in certain cases where we're trying to delay surgery or perhaps someone uh, has tried everything and they're not ready for surgery, I think PRP stem cell therapy is a very reasonable option to try to extend the life of an ankle joint. Right, yeah, you're right. We don't have great evidence, at least for the ankle. There is some, some evidence for the knee that in very early stages of arthritis, it may be helpful, but you know, like you're saying, the evidence just isn't there to support uh, the pretty significant cost for some of the patients. But, you know, if, if they're willing to try everything short of surgery, I also don't think it's unreasonable. So, yeah. Uh, and I, I tell them it's typically a coin toss. I think there's a 50-50 shot that they'll get better. You know, this is not going to cure you, but, you know, it, it may increase your endurance and, um, and your activity level. All right. So like you said, that the patients that we most commonly see have been dealing with these symptoms for a while and they've tried this stuff and it's just not cutting it. So now we're actually talking about an ankle fusion. Uh, so what are the techniques that you tell patients about and what do you like to do? Sure, so um, the technique, um, there's a, a multitude of techniques. Um, and I think if we start from kind of the minimally invasive technique, arthroscopically assisted or arthroscopic ankle fusion, I find that to be less common now, kind of with the advent of ankle replacement. So the patients that have really no deformity and they're uh, well lined, those patients probably get ankle replacements. Um, so I think we use that less. So I like to use open approaches. Um, I think, you know, introducing screws and I often use plates on the front of the ankle because it's mechanically stronger. 
and one of the things that we get concerned about is whether or not the fusion heals, right? So every time you attempt a fusion, there's a chance that it may not heal. And so we wanna really stack the odds in the favor of the patient. And so some of that is directly looking at the joint, being able to use um, bone graft and different things to increase the contact area of the joint for healing, and then certainly securing it until the body mends itself. And oftentimes that screws, and I like to use plates on the front because it's mechanically stronger. Right, yeah, there's, there's certainly all sorts of techniques out there. As you mentioned, there's plates from the front, there's plates from the back, and you can do it arthroscopically. So, you know, as, as you said, it's all about what makes the most sense for that patient and trying to prevent the non-union, which, which maybe leads us to a next discussion point. What are some of the, the things that we caution patients about? What are some of the complications with ankle fusions uh, that patients should know about? Yeah, so we just touched on non-union and that's something we probably should get into a little bit more. And, and, and there is a laundry list of risk factors um, that can increase the chance that your bone doesn't heal or you get a non-union. And, and certainly smoking has been a well-recognized risk for ankle fusions. And we know that if you smoke, the chance that you get a non-union is much, much higher than um, you know, uh, other populations. And just to give you some sense of the impact of smoking, every cigarette that you have decreases the blood supply to the foot and ankle 30% for three hours. So that's, that's pretty significant when you're trying to get something to mend. Um, certainly, you know, we, we worry about uh, infection, which is less than 1%. Um, I like to use antibiotics in the wound, which can decrease the chance of, of post-operative infection. Um, we worry about that the screws and plates uh, may bother the patient later and they may need another surgery for retrieval. Um, and I, I, I think the biggest thing that when, when we're talking to patients, it's really maybe not what the immediate risk is, but what, what is the long-term risk? What is, right. the, what is the cost is if we stiffen your ankle now, what does that cost look like in five years, 10 years, in 15 years? And we have good longitudinal studies that show that there is a cost to the fusion. And basically that is accelerated wear of the joints around the ankle. Um, and then you run into a more difficult situation because you have arthritis in an adjacent joint. Right. Sets up kind of a host of, of other problems that can happen. Right. Yeah, and, that, and that's a challenging scenario because, you know, then if you fuse that joint, you, you lose even more motion. So, um, but definitely, as you mentioned, one of the most common things is, is what we call subtalar arthritis, which is the joint just below the ankle. Um, so that can happen five years, 10 years, 15 years, you know, anywhere down the road. Uh, which is something to be aware of. We can treat it, but, um, you know, uh, a common reason a lot of people are pushing towards ankle replacements versus ankle fusions. And maybe we can get into that. You know, a, lo a lot of patients come in, maybe they've seen someone else and they've recommended a fusion or a replacement. And they're asking you, Hey doc, which one is better? What, what should I do? So, uh, what is your opinion on the patients coming in who are maybe a candidate for, for either? And, and who do you think is definitely not a candidate for a replacement and should go forward with the fusion? Right. So let me start off with the, the second part of your question, because it's probably easier to answer than the first part. Right. Um, so, so people that are not a candidate for an ankle replacement, in, in generalities, there's always ex some exceptions to the rules, but generally patients under the age of 50 years old, we exclude because we know that the implants have a finite lifetime or survivorship to them. And if so, if you have someone who's 40 that gets an ankle replacement and they last 10 to 15 years, then you place that patient in the cycle of replacements, which get harder to do as time goes on. And they may have an unsolvable problem later on in life. And so that's the dilemma with replacing an ankle kind of early in life. Um, patients that, um, you know, um, that have diabetes that's not well controlled uh, or those patients that have severe either diabetic neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy, certainly those are patients that are not good candidates for replacement. Um, if patients have had previous infections in and around the ankle joint, um, that may require some investigation, but certainly not the ideal patient for a replacement. Um, often, as, as we mentioned before, these patients have injuries that lead to arthritis. And so sometimes those injuries cause problems with the soft tissues or the skin around the ankle joint, and that may put the implant at risk for infection or something later. So there's a lot more, but those that's the grand oversight of 
patients that I think immediately get ruled out for replacement and fall into, um, into the fusion category. To answer right. the first part of your question, you know, if I have a patient that's over 50, that has a reasonable BMI, has a reasonable body weight, um, is healthy from a medical standpoint, if they have generally well-preserved range of motion, so the ankle moves well, but it hurts. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great um, uh, patient for an ankle replacement. Right. Um, and then, you know, the one thing that I, I didn't mention, but we also have to look at someone's occupation, right? So if sure. someone uh, does labor intensive work in, in construction, uh, something like that, we're not really sure how the implant's going to hold up under those loads because we just don't have the data. So those are things that we would we would need to kind of figure out between the patient and myself, whether or not they're gonna get a replacement or a fusion. All right. How about a common question that's maybe a little less technical, but that uh, I've certainly heard a number of times and that's, you know, you're gonna fuse my ankle. How am I gonna walk? How is that gonna work? The ankle doesn't move. Am I gonna be able to exercise? You know, what am I gonna be able to to do if you fuse my ankle? Right. Yeah. Great question. And different for everyone. And I, I think that the, the number one, um, the number one thing that improves someone's mobility is what is the quality or the health of the joints around the ankle? Because we know from the studies, if we fuse the ankle, the joint in front of the ankle and underneath take up about 40% of the motion that's lost at the ankle. So someone who has healthy joints around the ankle with an ankle fusion uh, walks very well. And oftentimes in a sneaker, you can't tell which side would have the fusion. Um, yeah. Certainly shoe gear helps them to, to walk better um, as well. But, um, but those are some of the things that, uh, that I would think about. All right, well, Dr. Fleming, you have a case you can share with us maybe so some of the uh, viewers can, can get an understanding of, of what an ankle fusion looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to do that. Okay. So um, this is just kind of a brief overview of some things that we talked about um, that I think are just kind of unique to ankle arthritis um, because it is a big deal. And certainly someone who has ankle arthritis um, has similar quality of life issues to someone who has hip, knee, and back arthritis. So just because it's a smaller joint doesn't mean it's less problematic for, for patients. Um, the good thing is that it's nine times less common than hip or knee. Um, and, and what we do know is the primary cause of someone who has ankle arthritis is typically an injury, and that happens early on in life, versus someone who has hip and knee arthritis, which is kind of wear and tear, and happens later on in life. And so the dilemma for Dr. Schaefer and I is what do we do with the patients who have arthritis in their ankle in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and how do we manage them for the remainder of life? And that's really the, the, the biggest problem uh, with patients that have uh, ankle fusion. So um, you mentioned it and I mentioned it as well, but you know, ankle fusions have predictable pain relief and, and that comes at a cost. And that cost is that we know that some patients are gonna develop arthritis later on down the line. And, and arthritis comes in a, a variety of flavors and they're not really all the same. And not to get into too much detail, but, but sometimes there's issues on the top side of the joint in the tibia. And sometimes there's issues on the bottom side of the joint uh, with the health of the bone called the talus. And sometimes there's positional issues, uh, et cetera. But these are all different examples of patients with ankle arthritis. So it's not a, a one size fits all. So these are the goals. We're trying to get stable. We're trying to get pain relief and we're definitely trying to get um, improved uh, function. And so I'll just share this case for you. This is a young gentleman who was in his uh, uh, 20s. He was in a motor vehicle accident. Um, he shattered the end of his shin bone. It's called a, a pylon or a pylon fracture. Um, and these have a notoriously bad outcome in terms of developing arthritis later on. So um, this gentleman had surgery, had, had well done surgery, and unfortunately the cartilage or the lining of the joint uh, degenerated over time. And you can see if we look um, at, the, at the ankle joint itself, that there's just no space. So when the black line thins out, the black line represents the cartilage. As the cartilage thins out, the bones get closer together. Um, and that's one way that we can tell um, the degree of arthritis. And so here he has bone on bone arthritis as the cartilage is gone. 
And he had tried PRP and as you mentioned, and he tried some other different types of uh, modalities and surgeries. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they just didn't work. And so um, if you look on the right, um, what you'll see is um, the, this plate that's on the front of the ankle, uh, and then there's these screws. And the whole concept here is we're really trying to bond the shin bone uh, to the ankle bone. And we filled that little gap in with, with bone graft. And these are necessary to hold the position of the ankle uh, while it heals. And then after that point in time, they're not necessarily necessary, but I would say less than 5% of the time do you need to go back in and, um, and retrieve those, uh, those screws and plates. That's a common question that I get uh, sure. uh, often. Well, thanks, Justin. That was a great case. A lot of great information today for our viewers regarding ankle arthritis. Uh, that wraps up our talk for today. If anyone out there has ankle pain or foot pain or really any orthopedic pain, we're happy to see you at UOA and you can make an appointment by calling us or visiting uoanj.com. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Kevin.